Hello everyone. Today's video is one that I'm really, really excited about. But before we get started, there's something I need to ask you guys. As a fairly new YouTube channel, when it comes to getting cars, I'm pretty much limited to the ones that I own, are owned by my close friends, some family members, and of course the cars that are brought to me by you guys for review. I do have relationships with a few dealers and a few manufacturers. But even when it comes to them, I can't just go there and basically say what I want to take out. That's sadly just not how it works. You know, companies like Toyota and Kia have a very, very long list of people that want to borrow cars from them. And as I'm only fairly small, I tend to go to the bottom of that queue. So although I really, really appreciate, and please don't stop putting in the comments cars you'd love to see me review, it's not always possible for me to just get my hands on whatever I want. There is, however, one car in particular, with me having been doing a lot of JDM stuff and some hatchbacks recently, that you have been asking to see. And that's the new Honda Civic FK8 Type R. Now, my local Honda dealer didn't have one to lend me. I don't happen to know anyone that's got one. So I thought, hey, let's take a punt and I'll email Honda UK Direct, with whom I have no relationship at all, and ask if I can borrow a car. And they said yes. That's amazing, and I am incredibly thankful to Honda UK and my contact there, Tom, for sorting this fantastic car out for me to review and you guys to enjoy. Now, the best way to make sure that I can continue getting cars like this from manufacturers is to try and make sure these videos do as well as they can. Now, believe it or not, the amount of likes a video gets is really, really super important. So if you could just do me a massive favor real quickly and hit the like button, and maybe if you haven't subscribed yet, consider hitting that too. That really does make a difference to the YouTube algorithms and will help this video do well. And maybe, just maybe, I'll be able to get that NSX off them someday. Anyway, enough begging from me. Let's get started with the video, shall we? This, of course, is the brand new Honda Civic Type R. Okay, it's been out for a few months, but it's the current one. Honda went a very, very long time without a Civic Type R at all when the FN2 was discontinued. Then, a few years ago, they introduced the FK2, and that wasn't received to universal acclaim. People said it was far too stiff and far too noisy, and they just weren't in love with it. This came out, it seems like, a very short time after, and things have changed. This is getting some serious love, and a few people that I know who really know their stuff about cars have told me this is meant to be a mega car, so I've been really looking forward to getting my hands on one. I'm going to do a walk around now, but rather than starting at the front, I'd actually like to start at the back. So follow me around. Possibly the most significant thing about the new FK8 Type R lies under this gorgeous and extended wheel arch. It is the fact that for the first time since the EP3, the Civic Type R has a fully independent rear suspension. The FN2 and FK2 both had a simple torsion beam set up at the rear. Um, part of the reason for that is the fact that the FN2 in particular shared its setup with the European Jazz, believe it or not. Now, Honda diehards might be sat there going, oh yeah, but the FD2 had fully independent setup as well. Yes, it did, but we never got that car. Now, you'll also see this huge rear wing, and it, along with the rest of the car's looks, have certainly divided opinion. But you know what? I kind of like it. And I like it because it works. This car is the only car in its class to produce actual downforce, or as Honda politely term it, negative lift. How much of it the car produces, I couldn't say. I don't think it's really much, but if you've ever done any high-speed driving on the autobahn, you'll know that the difference between having a little bit of lift and a little bit of downforce can be quite significant. However, Honda haven't just been focusing on making this car harder, sharper, and faster. Oh no, this suspension setup actually means that the car can ride better and handle better. Now this exhaust setup right in the back, you won't have failed to notice either. It's this interesting little triple tailpipe setup with one smaller central pipe. Now, it's not just that the designers were fans of the F40, I mean they might have been, I really don't know. The central pipe has a very interesting purpose. At lower speeds, it apparently helps accentuate the noise and make the car sound a little bit meatier. More crucially though, at higher RPM and at higher speed, it actually draws some air back in and reduces the boom from the exhaust. That's one of the major criticisms of the old FK2. And having done quite a few motorway miles on this car, I can say it works. The exhaust noise is 
not too intrusive. Now, of course, any Civic we can't discuss without talking about its engine, because let's face it, that's the one thing you talk about when discussing Honda Type R's of old. So let's have a look at what they're using now. It's called the K20, but it's not a K20 as we know it. Dubbed the K20 C1, this is a mild evolution of the lump used in the old Civic FK2. And it's got about 10 horsepower more than that car, bringing the total up to around 316 horsepower. The torque is around 295 pound foot. Now, there's a couple of stamps on this engine which might be of interest to you. One which says Earth Dreams Technology. Honda's attempt at convincing you this is a green car. Of more interest to us petrol heads though, the little stamp that says VTEC Turbo. Yes, VTEC lives on in the age of the turbo. However, it works in a very, very different way. It's basically backwards to how it used to be. Rather than engaging that high lift, high duration VTEC cam at higher RPM, it does it at lower RPM, then shuts off when you get into the top of the rev range. The reason for that apparently is that turbocharged engines don't like the sort of cam setup that the old Type R engines thrived on. But by engaging that cam at lower RPM, you can certainly improve drivability and performance lower in the rev range. And trust me, it works. The shove this thing produces from about 2,500 RPM is completely alien to anyone that is currently driving a reasonably stock EP3, FN2, TEG, basically any old school Honda engine. I know there are going to be people misty eyed about those old 9,000 RPM screamers, and hey, look, I'm one of those people, but in terms of performance, this gets the job done. I mean, just look at the thing. This car's stylist wasn't a shrinking violet, was he? Now, it really, really divides opinion, but me, I love it, especially in this championship white, and I'm really not normally a fan of white cars. There's two real reasons I love the looks of this car. Number one, I am a child. Number two, this thing couldn't possibly have come from anywhere other than Japan. Can you imagine the Germans making a car that looks like that? Not a chance. Now, it's not perfect. Uh, my big bugbear is the fact that you've got a number on the front of these fake grills. That's a bit disappointing, really, Honda, especially when you have real proper working aero on this car. It's a shame. Now, the front is really accentuated by this lovely carbon effect splitter with a little red line there. I think the black, white and red all go together nicely. I saw one of these in black when we picked this one up and it looked mean, but you know, I prefer this. I also like them in red and I love them in blue too. I've seen one in grey, not so much a fan of that. You've got the classic Type R red H at the front and you have this knacker duct on the bonnet, which is lovely because you can see it from the inside and it works. It draws nice, cool air into that hot engine bay. Overall, it's a well-styled car, but there's one thing it isn't to me. That's a hatchback. This is something that I noticed when I saw the first batch of the new shape, non-Type R Civics arrive in the country. Compared to the old FK2 and FN2, the styling is actually radically different. Rather than that one continuous triangular shape they used to have, this to me now looks and feels like a saloon car. You've got a very saloon-esque front, and at the back, especially if you imagine the car without the wing on it, you've nearly got a saloon-esque boot too. In fact, to me, with these four doors and plenty of space in the back for passengers, the only thing really qualifying this as a hatchback is the fact that it does have a hatch at the back, sat under these really quite cool and aggressive vortex generators. And that's not a bad thing. I know a lot of people really, really love hot hatches. I don't generally. And the fact that this looks a lot like a cool saloon car, in fact, to me, looks-wise, it doesn't feel so much like a continuation of the old Civic, it feels like a reinvention of the old rally reps, the Imprezas and Lancers. That's probably why I love it so much. But that does give you expectations of saloon pace and saloon handling. We're going to find out about that in just a minute, but first, I want to show you the cockpit. 
Now I hope you're a fan of red because you really don't have any choice in here. This is basically all you can have. Fortunately, I do really like it and I think this interior feels like a very, very special place. These seats are superb, nicely supportive, they'd be great on track and they're comfortable enough on the road. I spent three hours stuck in traffic yesterday in this car and it was fine. I needed a stretch at the end but who doesn't after having a nice long fight with the M25? The steering wheel is nice and thin. I don't like manufacturers beefing up and padding their wheels and Honda have resisted that temptation, so well done. I'm not so much of a fan of the fairly cheap and poor feeling buttons that they've put on the wheel, but they do at least work and you can feel just by touch which button you're going to press. In the centre here, you have this little touchscreen infotainment system. Now, this is the Type R GT, so for your extra about £2,000 over the base model, you get parking sensors front and rear, you get a wireless charging port for your phone, which is something that I find really quite useful and I'm actually enjoying having it on a few cars I've driven lately, and you get two-zone climate control and a Garmin-powered sat-nav system that works reasonably well. You get lovely red seat belts, loads of cubby holes for storage, You've got this carbon effect stuff in the center, these little red stripes everywhere, and note, six speed manual gearbox, the only option. Now, come over here and I'm gonna show you what the driver sees because this is an odd setup here. You have the obligatory start stop button down here, so I'm gonna hit that and make the car come alive. First off, it moans at you for not having your foot on the clutch, but I don't want to start the car, I just want to turn the ignition on. It likes to talk to you, this car. You get a nice woman's voice coming on and telling you how thick you are and how you don't know how anything in it works. Now, the centre section of the dash is a big LCD screen. Depending on which mode you're in, it will give you various things, and you can adjust, and you've got a huge selection of different things. So if you press this button, you can choose from such delights as a G meter, you've got turbo information, you've got something that looks an awful lot like the choke, but there's actually your uh, throttle and brake pedal positions. Why you want to know those, I don't know. And there's all sorts of stuff. You've got nav information, you've got speed limit information, you've got your sound information, you've got car settings, you've got music stuff, you've got phone stuff. Uh, basically, everything you could possibly want is in here. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fairly easy to use once you've got used to it I would say I'm not yet used to it what I'm not so keen on in here are these dials on either side on the right you have your fuel gauge and on the left your temperature gauge they are really really over styled and they seem to me like something that came from the 80s and people are like hey let's make everything look a bit funky and you know digital you know and digital was a cool word and um they just take up a lot of space. You know, you could have got, I think, a lot more going on in here for the space used by those dials. You know, they could both be on one side and you could maybe have an extra little screen down here. But, you know, I am uh, clutching at straws when it comes to finding something bad to say about the interior. No, it doesn't feel quite as premium as a German product, but I'd say it's a very, very nice place to be. Certainly the darker colored headlining, goes a long way to helping that. I'm a big fan of that. Do not like light colored headlinings. And this little screen down here is not too bad. Now, it's not the best thing in the world and uh, I'm not a big fan of touch screens in general. And I really don't like the fact that these buttons down here, you know, the power and the volume stuff, to me, they should be physical buttons. But otherwise, this feels fairly well integrated. Uh, I like the fact they've kind of not made their mind up as to whether they want it to be a sort of flush or not thing. I mean, it, it looks like you can sort of pull this out, but you, you can't. So I'd like that maybe a little bit better integrated, but I'm kind of happy with it as it is. And you've got, of course, your dual zone climate stuff here. And uh, there's the little wireless phone charging port. Down here, you have the toggle switch, which lets you choose your driving mode. You've got comfort, you've got sport, which is the default mode, and you've got plus R for pirates. But of course, can't really talk about those without the car being in motion, can we? So let's stop dilly-dallying and get out there. 
In an age where you can get five driving modes in a Kia, the Honda's 3 is quite refreshing. There is no individual mode, you simply have to go with what you're given. So the car's default mode is actually called Sport, and either side of that you have Comfort, which lightens and softens everything, and then Plus R, which in my opinion is probably best kept for the track because I don't think you really get any benefit from it on the road. Now the three elements being adjusted here are the sensitivity of the throttle pedal, the weight of the steering, and the stiffness of the dampers. Now in comfort mode, the steering is far too light. Unfortunately, in sport and plus R mode, it just goes completely the other way and becomes far too heavy. It's artificially weighted and there's really no reason for it. It's robbing the car of some of the little steering feel that it has. Now, I drove the car a lot yesterday in sport mode because why wouldn't you? But then when I switched the car into comfort mode for a little bit, I did realize something important. When that weight is removed from the steering, you get a little bit of a greater appreciation of what it's actually doing. And you then realize that the steering in this car is incredibly direct. It's not overly sensitive, it's not an overly quick rack, it's just very, very responsive to your input. That response and keenness to turn is masked a little bit when the extra weight of sport mode is added to the steering. But if you've driven one of these and not tried comfort mode, I suggest that you do because then you'll get a better feel of what the car is actually doing and you'll understand one of the chief reasons why this is such an enjoyable steer. And of course, it wouldn't actually be any good at all if it weren't for a great chassis underneath all that. The dampers, even in sport mode, actually do a very, very good job, especially when you consider the fact this car is basically wearing rubber bands on its wheels. The tires are 245 wide, the wheels are 20 inch, and that's standard, and they are only a 30 profile. They are very, very low profile tires. But that fully independent rear suspension does its job. The car has plenty of turbo lag, but it does pull very strongly from just over 2,000 RPM. It's a very impressive motor. It's not the most sonorous unit, but the noise is okay. Neither here nor there, really. I'd possibly like a little bit more of it, especially when I'm in the plus R mode, but I appreciate Honda have taken on the criticism of the last car that, that was then just too boomy. And that's fine. Driving this at motorway speed, it's perfectly civil. This car is available exclusively with the manual gearbox for two reasons, really. Number one, Honda say that in a hot hatchback, that's the only option you should really have. And uh, unofficially, I don't really think they actually have an automatic gearbox that would suit this car's character. But that's fine. In typical Honda fashion, this manual box is brilliant. The throw is very short, the knob is pleasing to hold, chortle chortle, and it's a nice action. You know exactly when you're in gear, the clutch is nicely weighted, the brake pedal is beautiful to use, in fact the only pedal I'm not in love with is the accelerator, it's a little too light for my liking, but that is nitpicking. From inside, that impression I got of this being more like a saloon car really does continue. You can actually see some of the bonnet at the front, and that's really, really nice. And I don't just mean the little bulge where you've got the knacker duct. I can actually see a bit more of it. This certainly feels like a large car, and I'm okay with that, because it has all the benefits of a large car. It feels very planted, feels very stable, and it's got lots of room in it. Even with my seat in exactly the position I like it, there's loads of legroom behind for potential passengers. Now today, it's a little bit grim out there. We've had somewhat mixed weather over the last couple of weeks, as you'll probably have noticed if you're a regular viewer of mine. Now, last night, yesterday afternoon, 
we had lovely, nice, dry, sunny weather. And I have a bit of a confession to make. The last few miles before I got home, it was clear, it was warm, the conditions were good, and I had a lot of fun in this car. A hell of a lot of fun. There's one car in particular that it's reminding me of, and it's not a Honda product at all. The car it really is reminding me of currently is that minivan that I drove last year. Now, bear with me a second, okay? Obviously, this is a lot quicker than that car, but the thing I'm trying to uh, get across here is the fact that that minivan, never driven that car before, in fact, never driven a mini of that generation ever before, but I got in it, and straight away, that car gave me the confidence to just throw it around the corners, knowing I was going to be fine, knowing you were going to get through. And you just drive it instantly at probably seven or eight tenths, and you just have a whale of a time. Other cars, you have to spend some time getting to know their limits. You know, each day you, you test them, you push a little harder, a little bit more, you're a little bit further, you brake a little bit later, until you eventually find out what they can do. With this though, I feel like from the off, I can just give it the bean straight away. And when you consider the fact that I'm not in love with this steering, that's the result, pure and simple, of an absolutely brilliant chassis and brilliant seats. I will always sing the praises and underline the importance of having good seats in a car. And these are great. You can really feel what the chassis is up to. And you may have just heard there a little blip of the revs. Love to say that was me. Uh, it wasn't. The car does have auto rev matching. Somehow you can apparently turn it off, but I don't know how. Ooh. <laughs> so, what you will have heard there is the car really, really struggling for traction. Now the system that Honda use is quite similar to Ford's Revo Knuckle and it basically tries to separate the steering and accelerative forces that go through the front axle. Now it does a reasonably decent job, the car doesn't talk steer too much but it is still present. Frankly it's something that's just going to happen, it's a fact of life when you're dealing with a front wheel drive car that's got this much power. So I don't really count that against it. The traction control system does allow a little bit of slip before intervening and a lot more slip in plus R mode and the car does have a Torsen limited slip differential up at the front. In fact in terms of Type R's this is possibly the closest a European spec car has ever been to a JDM one. In the past the Japanese markets always got a little bit more power or some extra goodies or things that we just didn't for whatever reason. In this one though, I'm told basically the uh, major difference between the two is the language of the infotainment system. And that's a good thing. My Japanese is terrible. The gearing is, in my opinion, pretty much perfect. Second is good for about 60, third about 90, and so on. The ratios are fairly closely stacked and that's important for keeping the little car on the boil. On little British B roads at 316 horsepower is absolutely plenty. You can make really, really good progress. Having driven the car yesterday in the dry and now today in the damp, it's amazing how different it feels. In the dry, you've got this absolute unshakable confidence and you still have that in the wet, but what you can really feel is the car moving around and dancing under you. It's an enjoyable car to hustle, really, really is. And it doesn't feel too big for these roads either, which I'm really, really impressed with. I think this is probably the best front wheel drive chassis I've ever driven. And the steering's not the best, but in terms of outright pace, it's phenomenal. For a turbocharged engine, it likes to rev well enough, but of course it does its best work in the mid-range. And that means you've got a nice, healthy power band where you can make 
very, very swift progress. And really from about two and a half thousand to basically the red line, this car pulls hard. It was quite funny too, driving back yesterday because uh, I'm used to driving some fairly nice, fairly wacky looking cars. And then when I get in a hot hatch, I tend to expect to be invisible. <laughs> Not in this thing. The amount of people eyeing this car up was crazy. If you don't like attention, this is not the car for you. I kind of like it though. Now, although this car is no flyweight, it is noticeably lighter than the Ford Focus RS. You also sit quite a bit lower in it. One of my criticisms really of a lot of modern cars is the fact that they're all trying to get you to sit really, really high. I think this is to cotton on to the whole thing that people love SUVs for. People love this elevated driving position. I really don't, especially when I'm in something sporty. I want to be nice and low. And this gives you that. The driving position in here is, well, faultless really. And I congratulate Honda for that. It's certainly something that they've improved because in the FN2, it was terrible. EP3, great. I really loved the old EP3. It was a fantastic car to pedal, but like all of those Type R's and like my Elise as well, which had the 1.8 litre Toyota VVTLI engine, you really, really needed to keep it on the boil to get the best out of it. And if you dropped out of that power band, well, you just started going backwards. With this, that just doesn't happen. And that means you can really, really keep the pace up. But by having that manual gearbox, it means you're still involved. Some cars I've driven, Nissan GTR, Mark 7.5 Golf R, when you've got that dual clutch box, it's just this unrelenting surge of power. And okay, that's kind of fun in its own way, it's a great way to produce brilliant numbers and it'll help on track but when it comes to driving feel driving sensation i love a manual you can't beat it i am worried i'm going to run out of fuel in this thing though before i went out today i did forget to fill the car up and uh, it's currently quite low on the gauge uh, that brings me around to another topic the uh, fuel consumption as a cruiser, the only thing really hampering this car is a relatively short range. Originally, I thought the car was just drinking fuel like there was no tomorrow. However, having driven it a little bit more, I now realized that that was largely in part due to the fact that it has a relatively small fuel tank. It's only 47 liters, which is quite a bit smaller than what I'm used to, and it's also somewhat pessimistic. We ran it completely dry, according to the car, and there was still plenty left in it. Well, we made it to the fuel station just in time, and to be honest, <laughs> I can think of very few more pleasurable ways of burning petrol. The Honda Civic Type R FK8. And if you're on the lookout for a hot hatchback and you want to buy the fastest, best performing, most practical and easy to live with thing that you can find for the money, go and buy a Golf R. With that DSG gearbox, the Mark 7.5 crosses ground at an incredible pace. A couple of minor mods and you've got a car with 400 horsepower and supercar baiting performance. But ultimately, it's a car that leaves me cold. This thing is truly special. And if you've got even an ounce of petrol in your veins, this is the car you should be buying. I appreciate that with its outrageous looks and front wheel drive and manual box, it's not a car for everyone. And I'm fine with that. It is a car for me. And I've absolutely loved every minute of my time with it. I want to thank Tom and Honda UK for lending us this for the weekend. We've had a ball. Thank you guys for watching. If you haven't already, please like, and if you'd like to, please subscribe. It really does help us. We hope you'll join us for the next one. Thanks, guys, and bye-bye.